Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 770 Psychological Testing and Assessment. And before we begin, another great comic from xkcd.com. If you haven't already checked it out, you really should. It, they are among uh, my favorite cartoons for math, science, philosophy, and other kind of interesting topics. Um, Anyway, this is the first in a two or maybe three part series that I'm going to do on the history of psychological testing. Uh, for lack of a better title, I'm calling this one the origins of psychological testing. And I'll begin with the question that you've probably heard before if you've taken almost any class in college or even a good, good history and science classes in high school, which is why study history? Why study in a class about psychological testing and assessment, the history of psychological testing and assessment? Well, I think we can make an argument that any mature science can trace its history and maybe should trace its history and in doing so can see uh, the development of theories and different technologies that have been made over time. Um, doing this gives you a sense of the progress that science has made or that the people working within that science have made and also the mistakes that they've made, the places where theories were shown to be incorrect or the applications of those theories were shown to be um, impractical or unethical or otherwise problematic. Um, also, I think history, studying history, gives us a sense of the social context in which science takes place. Uh, science is not an abstraction. Science doesn't occur in some way disconnected with real people and real problems. Uh, we can see that certainly in the history of psychological testing, the contexts in which different aspects of psychological testing developed. And we can also see some of the consequences, the good consequences and frankly the not so good consequences that have occurred over time when tests have been used and in times misused. It's important to uh, have an appreciation for this, I believe. You know, testing is a very important part of this history, and by this history I mean the history of psychology. Psychology, like other sciences, thrives upon testing. Uh, probably no better quote uh, can be found for that, uh, or at least to suggest the importance of that in the history of psychology than this one from James Cattell, 1890. Psychology cannot attain the certainty and exactness of physical sciences unless it rests on a foundation of experimentation and measurement. A step in this direction could be made by applying a series of mental tests to a large number of individuals. You know, Cattell recognizing at the tail end of the 1800s that this new thing that was happening, this new science, psychology, that was emerging would only really be legitimate, at least in standing with respect to other sciences, particularly physics and chemistry, the physical sciences, if it could be uh, quantifiable, if it could study things in a way that involve reliable and valid measurements. So, okay, that's some, some big ideas, or at least one or two big ideas, a big quote. What's the overview for what we're going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to just begin by highlighting a couple bits of history from early testing. I'm going to talk a little bit about physiognomy and phrenology as examples of a kind of a, a blind alley that testing uh, in uh, psychological testing, mental testing went into. I'm going to talk about the so-called brass instruments era of testing. And I'm going to begin to talk about rating scales, which kind of bridge us into more modern forms of testing, which I'll largely cover in the next one or two lectures. Again, depending on exactly how I sort through my PowerPoints. Okay, so early forms of testing. Now, many sciences can trace back uh, their history to ancient Rome or ancient Greece, uh, ancient uh, other ancient civilizations in the Middle East or elsewhere in the world. Psychology can do that. Psychology can even trace some aspects of its history all the way back to ancient China. And particularly here, we're talking about the history of testing. And there is evidence from history of testing going back as far as at least a couple thousand years BC in China. And a lot of this testing had to do with um, screening applicants for civil service in uh, at different imperial positions. 
Uh, and this program of testing changed over the millennia um, up through um, you know, sort of the Han Dynasty in 200 uh, BC through 200 AD, uh, where, as far as we know from historical records, this testing involved many days of written examinations uh, on a variety of different topics, philosophy, poetry, um, the arts, etc., rhetoric, that people would have to pass if they wanted to gain positions within the large uh, sort of bureaucracy of the imperial government, which you know, if you could get that type of job would be a fantastic boon for both you and your family and, and your descendants. So there was a lot of competition for these jobs and incredibly grueling, as far as we can understand from history, incredibly grueling tests. Tests which went on uh, well into uh, you know the 1300s and uh, again were largely continued up through roughly modern times. I mean, well up into the 1900s, there were very elaborate tests in um, for civil service in China and indeed as time went by in other countries, you know, the United States included. But this idea that testing uh, for um, abilities for potential to serve in different positions, uh, something which we might now, nowadays call um, aptitude tests, um, ability tests perhaps, vocational placement testing, those, uh, those ideas will go back literally thousands and thousands of years. So the important points here to take from this little vignette uh, in history is that psychological testing has a very long history and importantly or I think interestingly for our purposes this history is related to practical concerns. Now clearly uh, people use testing and assessment for a variety of purposes. Some of them involve basic science uh, which can be rather uh, abstract or sort of divorced somewhat from the real world but in the main the types of testing that we're interested in and types of assessment procedures that we're interested in uh, were developed in response to practical concerns. You, know, you are the emperor of China, you need to have a large staff of people to uh, execute your commands across your massive empire. Uh, a lot of people want those jobs and you have to select the people who are the best ones for it. Um, similar types of concerns of course uh, occur in modern uh, civil service testing and in other types of vocational testing. Um, another important point or idea that emerges here is that there is a kind of a question as to what is it that you measure? Uh, when we talk about mental testing, um, the things that we're talking about, the constructs we're referring to are necessarily abstract. Someone's ability to lead or follow orders, someone's knowledge of uh, necessary information to fulfill a job, someone's potential for mental illness, etc. These are things which can be measured but which are uh, undeniable less um, are, are more difficult to measure than our physical objects in the world around us and thus we can see well back through the history of testing in China which I didn't talk about that much but suffice it to say the testing took different forms over the millennia there was some sort of back and forth as to exactly what should be on the tests how should we assess people's potential for these jobs and those same concerns uh, with you know what is it exactly that we should measure or what is it exactly that we can measure reliably and with validity. Those things uh, come up even today. These are these are new ideas, uh, but in some respects, of course, these are very old ideas. And we can see that when we look at our rather long uh, history, uh, history of testing in psychology. Now I mentioned before that I wanted to talk a little bit about physiognomy and phrenology. Uh, this is a, a kind of an interesting area of historical discussion, I think, and it highlights a number of interesting ideas um, that generally speaking have to do with this sort of blind alley or, or dead end that testing of uh, mental testing uh, went down for quite a long uh, number of years. So physiognomy in its origins is rather old and dates back at least uh, to the Greeks, to Aristotle, um, who and other people around the same time as him argued that the soul, that is maybe what we might call today the mind, or the, uh, the mental faculties that, that imbue our body um, with purpose and, and animation, those things, that thing, the soul and the body in some way sympathize and thus we can see in the physical body manifestations of our internal working world, our, our mind or our soul or, or, or likewise. So you know, who you are as a person, the traits of your personality, phrases we might use nowadays, are in some way reflected or echoed in the shape, 
and, and the sort of the, the comportment of your body. Um, much, much later in history, a, a Swiss uh, physiognomist, also a poet, named Johann Lavater um, published a book called Essays on Physiognomy, which included uh, drawings to depict the relationship between physical characteristics and mental faculties or, or proclivities. Can see some of these pictures here, and I know that the uh, the, the text is is rather small. But if you if you look, um, you can see a little bit of a description of how the physical shape and sort of uh, composure of the body is uh, is reflective of aspects of that person's mental abilities or personality and the like. Physiognomy uh, gave way to phrenology a, uh, or, or found its kind of uh, apotheosis or culmination in phrenology. Phrenology was a kind of a, what we nowadays call a pseudoscience uh, based around the idea that different parts of the brain um, were responsible for different aspects of mental functioning, something we more or less agree with nowadays today, but that the relative development of those areas of the brain was reflective of the relevant relative development of those abilities or faculties. Thus, if you had a part of your brain that was uh, particularly involved in memory and you were someone who was very good at memory, then that part of your brain physically would be relatively more developed than other parts of your brain adjacent to it. Moreover, that relative development would be reflective in bumps or kind of uh, deformations in your skull. Thus, someone uh, touching or sort of moving their hands across your skull could sense bulges or, or sort of indentations which would reflect the development of the underlying brain uh, tissue and would further reflect the development of different parts of your personality or your cognitive abilities or the like. And uh, over the years there are a lot of people who are phrenologists. The, the one we remember most famously is kind of the originator of some of these ideas was Franz Josef Gall, who's a German physician. And uh, as you can see here in my, in my notes, kind of advanced this idea that different Different areas of the, of the brain govern different traits, and that development of these areas causes bumps or deformations in the skull which can be measured. This idea was popular in Europe and was eventually brought to the United States, to America, by uh, Johann Spurzheim, who was a student of Gauls and, and did a lot to popularize phrenology in America and in Britain. Uh, again, there are a lot of people involved in phrenology. I'm just highlighting a, a few. And if you've read your text at this point, you know that the text goes into some detail of discussion of phrenology. Um, 
there's a fellow named Henry uh, Lavery. Lavery. Uh, I couldn't find the dates for his life, sad to say. He was an American inventor who built a fascinating instrument called the psychograph. The psychograph was essentially a mechanized way of calculating or, or performing uh, phrenological measurements. One that could uh, produce a printout of different uh, profiles of measurement, which could be then read as a sort of a reflection of someone's underlying mental uh, faculties. So here are some pictures of the psychograph. It, you can't see them very clearly. It's kind of grainy. Those are the best I can find on Google. But if you're at all curious, I encourage you to, to look further. An amazing piece of technology popular in the early part of the 20th century, uh, where you would stand and you know, the assistant or the person running the test would lower this kind of basket-like device over your head. It was um, full of little spring-loaded um, uh, metal tubes, which would then, because of the spring loading, press up against your skull, some pressing more, some pressing less, depending on the shape of your skull. Those little um, pressure uh, sense, uh, measurements would be then translated into ticks on a piece of paper, which would then be graphed, and you would get something like a printout, which would give a profile of your different mental abilities. Pretty amazing and pretty popular. The psychograph was a, kind of a marvel invention of its time. And uh, I don't know, I, I look at it now and um, especially in recent months, if you're recording in 2016, and if you paid much attention to kind of research methodology news stories, which maybe some of you have, maybe some of you haven't, you'd be forgiven if you haven't. If you've paid much attention to kind of current events in research methodology, you may have noticed that there is increasing concern about some potential methodological and statistical flaws in the way we do functional magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging these flaws potentially calling into question a very large amount of research using fMRI. Um, I don't know, I can't help but look at, uh, at the uh, old pictures of the psychograph and think, gosh, these people were so intent on measuring something and they thought they had the technology right. Nowadays, we think they got it all wrong. I wonder if someday in the future, people will look back on our fMRIs or our dense array EEGs and draw a similar sort of skeptical or judgmental conclusion conclusions. I don't know, just something I think about when I look at fun old photographs like these of the psychograph. So uh, to, to back it up just a bit, phrenology was popular in the 19, in, in, in America and elsewhere in the world well up into the mid part of the 20th century. So this is not ancient history. This isn't the ancient Chinese civil service exam. This is people who, you know, who were alive when your grandparents were alive, your grandparents perhaps. Ask them if they ever had a psychograph test. Um, eventually, uh, skepticism kind of overcame uh, phrenology and the use of the psychograph. Uh, measurements made by phrenologists were reliable, at least somewhat, in the sense that you could be trained to perform these measurements, or and some of the measurements could be mechanized using instruments like the psychograph, but they weren't particularly valid. So uh, what I mean by that, and we'll talk about this a lot across the semester, is that those uh, measurements made, uh, those tests results, didn't really correspond respond to any predictions that you could be that you could make based on relevant theories of mental processes such as personality uh, mental abilities or the like so you could have a psychograph done wouldn't really tell you much of anything and that lack of validity is really the uh, a nail in the coffin of, of any testing in this case the testing in phrenology some important ideas to take from this little bit of history. Um, one is that, well, we need to be very careful about how we evaluate measurements. And this should be pretty obvious to anyone who's done any amount of science in almost any field, but particularly in psychology, particularly in the psychology of testing and assessment, we need to be mindful of how we construe, how we think about how we evaluate reliability and validity of our tests. If we don't do this, we may, some time in the future, realize that we've run down a blind alley like the phrenologists did. Um, a second point that I, I kind of hinted at earlier is I think humility. I mean, let's be honest. Um, these people in the past, the phrenologists, the physiognomists, it's tempting to think that they were just not very smart. They got it wrong because they were stupid. And nowadays we're smart, so we wouldn't make those same sort of mistakes. 
who knows for sure, but it's it's likely, I think, that those people were pretty smart and they were doing their best and they still got it wrong. They measured things in a way that isn't particularly accurate or uh, consistent. Um, and if we recognize that, maybe we feel a little bit humbled and maybe we're also feeling a little bit encouraged to apply critical thinking to what we're doing nowadays, whether it's our fMRI machine or our tests of um, intellectual abilities or personality traits or the like. We need to understand things like our history. We need to understand relevant aspects of psychometric theory so that we can hopefully avoid some of those problems and also be humble about the fact that there are some things we understand and there are some things we don't when it comes to measurement. Okay, a little bit of ancient history, a little bit of a, a quirky kind of funny area in the history of testing that is phrenology. Let's move on to talk about what we call or what textbooks call, our textbook calls the brass instruments era of testing. The brass instruments era of testing, uh, well, and, and by extension, most what we think of as mental testing in, in the modern period really has its origins, at least in part, in other sciences, particularly in astronomy. And what's fascinating to me as someone who, who reads a bit about the history of science is that around the, you know, kind of the late 1700s into the 1800s and up into the 1900s, people, you know, sciences of various sorts were flourishing, astronomy included. People were using increasingly sophisticated uh, telescopes to make measurements of stars, the course of planets, etc. And one thing that was fascinating to some and troubling to, to many was the fact that measurements weren't entirely consistent. Um, one astronomer um, you know, making a measurement of the altitude, you know, in terms of degrees from the horizon of a star would make a measurement that was slightly different than another astronomer, even if they were using the same telescope at the same time in the same location. Um, something that at the time didn't make a lot of sense. People thought, well, you know, as our technology gets better, our, our variability, our error, as they call it, should get smaller. And, and it did, but it didn't entirely go away. There were differences. Um, people tended to, you know, to not measure things entirely consistently, uh, one to person to the other, or even one person measured or compared against himself or herself over time. Um, and again, this troubled people, especially astronomers, because they, they thought, oh no, if we can't measure things consistently, can we be a science? But it fascinated other people, including among them Wilhelm Wundt, who we'll introduce in just a couple slides and who you probably already know from other class, because he and, and other folks like him wondered if these differences in um, measurements might not reflect uh, errors in the actual technology of measurement, like, oh, you know, the, the telescope broke slightly in between the first measurement and the second measurement, or the lens deformed or whatever, but rather might reflect differences in the mental functioning of the two people making the measurement. You know, there's something different about uh, astronomer A's mind as compared to astronomer B, and that difference or those differences account for or explain the differences in the measurements that they are making. Um, you know, not to dwell upon this point too much, but uh, in one of my favorite history books of, of psychology and of, of statistics, um, a book that I've mentioned in other classes, for those who've taken other classes for me, uh, Salzburg's A Lady Tasting Tea. Uh, the author, Salzburg, Jonathan, I think, um, makes, a, you know, goes on at some length about how this was kind of a, he thinks, a sort of a revolutionary moment in the history of science when we realized that measurements we're never going to be precise, not just for things that have to do with uh, mental faculties, but really for almost everything, anything that can be studied. Measurements are never precise there. There's an element of variability, or you might even say randomness to measurement. And the recognition of this was profoundly important for a lot of science, including for psychology, as, as we'll see. Um, what, you know, among the other kind of consequences of this recognition by Wundt and others was the idea that this, there ought to be underlying um, laws or features of thought about which people vary. Like all of us have some faculties, mental faculties that are alike to others. You know, that's pretty obvious, but that we might vary in dimension along these faculties, things to do with attention, things to do with perception, things to do with memory and the like. And these common laws of thought 
uh, you know, literally are called psychonomics. And, and even nowadays, there are people who, who work in the field of psychonomics. There are journals and conferences of psychonomics. And it kind of makes, I don't want to say it makes me laugh, but it's an interesting phrase because it really harkens back over a hundred years to this idea of discovering the underlying laws or features of, of thought or, or, or of the mind. Um, and, and relatedly, or, or importantly, as I kind of said before, um, discovering or studying the individual variability on these common features or common laws. Like we all have a capacity to deploy attention, but we vary in features of that attention. We all have a capacity to retain information in memory, but we vary one to the other and perhaps even one to his self or herself over time in our capacity to use that memory. So uh, the idea that measurements were, were not entirely precise, not perfectly consistent, sparked among other um, kind of thoughts or ideas, the idea that there were these underlying features of mind and that people vary in them. Um, those were really important realizations for psychology. And, you know, to get to the point, you know, why do we call this all the brass instruments error? Well, there was a great desire to develop technology in psychology for measuring these features of mental abilities, these psychonomics, um, and then measuring differences in them. So uh, people in laboratories around the world, mostly in Germany, but ultimately in other countries, um, developed instruments often made of brass, weights, calipers, rulers, and the like, which they could use to measure things like sensory thresholds, reaction times, ability to dis distinguish between different masses or sizes, etc. And the idea was to <clears throat> use these instruments on a large number of people and measure the variability in people's abilities to perform these tasks using these brass measurements, these brass instruments. So I've already mentioned him a couple times and you know anyone who's taken even a you know a good intro psych class or good history and systems class probably remembers Wilhelm Volt, um, one of the founding fathers of psychology, developed the first well, what we think of now is one of the first psychology laboratories in, I believe it's Leipzig, if I'm not forgetting my history, um, and did uh, some basic experiments with equipment like the equipment he called the thought meter. You know, instruments designed to measure things like reaction times or perception of stimuli and the like, with the idea of uncovering these um, subtle differences or subtle variations from one person to the other in their abilities to perform basic mental processes. Around the same time, Francis Galton in England, famous uh, for all sorts of reasons, he was sort of a, a Renaissance man, a polymath, a genius in many fields, cousin of Darwin, studier <coughs> of hereditary, one of the, or of heredity, one of the people to first advance ideas about the transmission of mental uh, abilities from one generation to the next, was very interested in the idea of conducting measurements in this way, this brass instrument approach, or at least what we now call the brass instrument approach. So Galton took ideas uh, from the research of Wundt and others and combined them into uh, his anthropometric laboratory. This is a laboratory uh, where you could come and you could be measured in a variety of different ways that had to do with testing um, reaction time, you know, sensory thresholds, uh, memory, etc., etc. And uh, he recorded this data in a database and you can see here the advertisement for it. Um, and tried to gather data on the relationship between these measurements and other features of people's lives. You know, their, their level of um, uh, success in their careers, their uh, level of intelligence as judged by other people to see if there were relationships between these underlying uh, processes, these supposed underlying processes and other psychological variables. James Cattell uh, mentioned him earlier, of course, or gave a quote from him earlier. He's an American psychologist who studied with both Wundt and Galton and brought this research approach with him to the United States. He's credited with coining the term mental test, and he um, brought with him this idea uh, of conducting measurements. 
um, things like uh, you know how your hand strength if you were squeezing a dynameter um, how fast you could move your hand across a, a distance like your hand speed your two-point threshold for touch degrees of pressure needed to sense pain weight differences reaction time time to name colors judgments uh, bisections of lines repeated letters etc etc and one of uh, his students was a guy named Clark Whistler, who uh, studied with him and then studied the correlation of these uh, measured abilities with different sorts of achievement, particularly academic achievement. Uh, you know, how well uh, measurements uh, made using this kind of uh, Wundtian or Galtonian tradition corresponded to things like class ranking or grade point average or the like. Unfortunately, for the Brass Instruments era researchers and, and testers, there was really little or no correlation between test scores and academic performance. So just as an example, the correlation between a test of memory and someone's class rank might be at the level of 0.16. And that's probably about as good as it gets. Many of the correlations are even smaller than that small correlation. Raising the idea, you know, raising an idea among others, I suppose, of the criterion validity of this type of testing. If the test is supposed to be measuring something that's correspondent to uh, to your um, level of overall intellectual ability, your your intelligence, to use a somewhat more modern term, then ought we not to see higher correlations or stronger relationships? Perhaps even more troubling, there's little or no correlation between the various tests in most of these groups or batteries of brass instruments tests. So the correlation between a particular color naming task and the hand movement speed task might be, you know, positive 0.19, again, still a pretty small correlation. And the correlation between that color naming task and a different type of movement speed or reaction time task might be negative 0.15. So, you know, pretty small and, and maybe small, but in the other direction. Um, again, if the idea or the theory is that there's some underlying mental ability which corresponds to a kind of an efficiency in the nervous system, and, and although I didn't put a slide about this, that was fundamentally the idea that Galton and others had, which is that all these different measurements ought to be related to just how efficient your nervous system is. If you're very efficient nervous system, you know, you have very fast reaction time and good ability to differentiate stimuli and, and good memory because you really kind of have a brain that's fired up. If you're not so good at this, if you have a generally slower or more sluggish and more less, or a less efficient nervous system, you're worse at all these tasks. Well, if that's true, then we'd expect that these tasks ought to be fairly highly correlated with one another, but they weren't. Um, calling into question, among other questions, I suppose, the construct validity, the, the idea that the, um, the construct of intellectual ability being measured, the idea of this sort of central, sort of unitary efficiency of the brain, um, calling that into question, is it really the case that, that this is the accurate way of thinking about mental abilities? So um, some important points to take away from this little bit of history. Um, well, one, again, uh, is this idea that we need to be careful or thoughtful about how we evaluate our measurements. You know, just because we have a theory that, that um, you know, the, um, the brain's efficiency uh, in processing information ought to be related to uh, your reaction time in a particular test doesn't mean it's so. And any type of test, whether it's a brass instruments type test or a more modern type of test, needs to be evaluated with respect to its reliability and its validity in the, its various forms. And we'll talk a lot in future lectures about reliability and about validity and different ways we think about those ideas and different ways we evaluate them in tests and uh, other measurements. Um, another important point or interesting point that emerges from this is the way that psychological testing is often and, and mostly a, a practical enterprise. Um, we need tests which relate to real world things that we care about. I mean, one could argue that brass instruments era testing was interesting for its own sake and probably it was and maybe in some respects it still is. But the fact that it didn't seem to relate to something like academic performance or job performance, uh, things which people, most people care about was kind of the um, 
to reuse a phrase I've already used, uh, the, the nail in the coffin. The, that was the damning point in this research. In fact, so much so that, uh, as your textbook mentions, um, uh, Whistler, the, uh, the fellow who uh, worked with Cattell, apparently was so kind of frustrated by the, uh, the, the poor performance of his, his tests and the kind of dismal results of his research that he left um, psychology entirely and got a degree in anthropology and went on to study cultural differences um, and had a kind of a very environmentalist view of cultural differences. So almost the antithesis of his earlier interests, which were largely around the idea of discovering common features uh, in the brains or the minds of all people, features about which people vary somewhat. Um, so he, poor guy. Well, ultimately, I think he did well, but interesting guy, I suppose. Um, another important point to make, I suppose, is, um, <clears throat> that is or is to note is the progress of science. You know, the failure of one theoretical and measurement system, brass instruments era testing, led to eventual progress in another. And that's progress I'm going to talk about a little bit in the next few slides and a lot in the future lectures. Yeah, you know, this wasn't, uh, the brass instruments era wasn't quite the dead end or the blind alley that uh, was phrenology. Um, because in some ways it, it led to ideas which were picked up in other ways, but it was similar. It was a, it was a failure or, or a stumbling point, one that was overcome later by other people and other researchers, uh, other clinicians leading down in history to today. So with that idea, with that perspective in mind, let's move on, or I'll move on a little bit and talk about early rating scales. Rating scales are in some ways kind of the opposite of what we were talking about with brass instruments and, and with phrenology. Those were attempts at science which were based very much on um, instrumentation to measure aspects of the body or the behavior, reaction times for instance, with the idea of gathering information about mental processes. Rating scales, as you almost certainly know, are, uh, are you know, take the approach of gathering information usually by asking people questions or by observing their behavior directly. So at the risk of repeating myself too much, um, this approach, rating scales, um, is based in the idea that we can ask questions uh, and we can make observations of behavior and use that information to learn about mental processes. And in that respect, I suppose it's a relatively more direct or somewhat more obvious or practical approach to measuring mental abilities than were some of the instrument heavy approaches uh, favored earlier or somewhat contemporaneously in the brass instruments world or the phrenological world. Now the origins of rating scales are quite old, um, you know, dating back at least as far as uh, the Greeks and the Romans. You know, Galen, who is a, uh, a Greek uh, physician working in Rome, actually for a time working providing treatment to gladiators, if you can believe that, um, was interested in uh, differences in what we now call personality or, or temperament, kind of aspects of people's emotionality. And he had a theory um, of, the, of these differences based on the relative um, sort of amounts and sort of activity of different bodily humors. So uh, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile uh, exist in the human body. That's true. And uh, Galen thought, and a lot of other people at that time thought, that the relative kind of amounts of those humors uh, would have influences on your emotions and your behavior, and thus your kind of overall personality. And these, uh, you know, these relative differences from one person to another explained in some way the differences in personality that we observe uh, from one person to the other. Galen kind of originated some of those ideas and worked with some of those ideas, wrote about them, promoted them. And for our purposes, it's kind of interesting because he developed a rating scale to kind of uh, characterize people on their relative levels of blood and bile and phlegm, which to say it that way sounds kind of disgusting, but it actually isn't all that different than, for instance, trying to characterize people uh, as different from one another in terms of their relative levels of personality traits like extroversion or, or, or openness to experience or the like. Um, that idea of a kind of a profile for each person uh, originates, at least in part, within Galen's time and with Galen and some of the stuff that he wrote about.
quite a long amount of time later in the history uh, of testing, well up into the, you know, in the late 1600s, we have the German philosopher Christian Tomasius, who could rock a big old wig and a tiny little mustache. Um, he developed a theory of personalities uh, that corresponded in a corresponding way of testing them. He had the idea that personality could be characterized by four major dimensions, sensuousness, acquisitiveness, social ambition, and rational love. So not quite the humors of Galen, but similar in the idea that there are these four basic factors or variables which uh, describe both the commonalities among people, we all have some level of each of them, but the differences among people, we vary in our relative levels of them. And what's really fascinating about Tomasius is he developed a scale for measuring these that could be uh, performed by a judge. So a, a judge might sort of basically fill out a, a questionnaire or a survey about a particular person and rating him, or rating her on these different qualities. And what's even more fascinating about Tomasius is he published reliability data on ratings made by these judges. So he, he and a group of judges rated different people and then compared their ratings. So this is actually really, uh, you know, kind of a fascinating moment that almost catapults us into modern psychometrics where we uh, have a particular theory. The theory uh, is evaluated by testing hypotheses, but in order to test those hypotheses, we have to make measurements. In order to make measurements, we have to establish the reliability and hopefully the validity of the measurements. Um, Tomasius was clearly concerned with some of those very ideas. Important point to take away from this slight additional bit of history I've talked about with rating scales is that rating scales became a really valuable uh, uh, measurement tool. Um, and that's pretty obvious. I mean, think about psychological testing. It's almost impossible not to imagine some sort of a, a rating scale. And the reason why they're so valuable is, is partly they're relatively easy to administer, at least as compared to a lot of the other um, types of testing that we could do back in the day, brass instruments, phrenology, or even that we can do nowadays. You know, it's easier to ask someone to fill out a questionnaire or to rate someone on, on a scale probably than it is to stick their head in an fMRI. So there's some real value in terms of the ease of use. Um, these instruments are also relatively easy to evaluate in terms of their reliability and validity. We can gather data on questionnaires or on survey items and we can subject them to modern uh, forms of statistical analysis, some of which we'll talk about in future lectures. Speaking of future lectures, time to do a little bit of a preview for what's coming up. I'm going to talk about more about rating scales in the next lecture or two, and certainly elsewhere in the semester, um, because they are not the only way we gather information, but they're a big part of the way that we gather information. They are, in a sense, the, the hallmark of our modern approach. Um, I'm also going to talk about the rise in modern intelligence testing in my next lecture. I kind of left off with the sort of the the dead end or the failure um, of the brass instruments approach, the Galtonian kind of Wundtian approach to measuring uh, different um, different mental capacities or mental faculties. Um, let's see what happened after that. And relatedly, I'm going to talk about the rise of modern personality testing. You know, in in a sense, I. I previewed or I hinted at the origins there with, with Galen and Tomasius and, and probably some others who I should have talked about but skipped. Um, let's see what happened next and how we ended up with now some of our modern uh, sort of conceptions of personality uh, and modern ways of testing personality. Okay, so uh, that's all for this lecture. And as, as I always say, thanks for your attention. I, I do appreciate it. You're watching these videos on YouTube or on Blackboard. Hopefully they're making sense to you. Hopefully you're enjoying them. Um, if not, or if you have questions, let me know. Make comments in YouTube. Send me emails if you're in my class or post in the discussion board if you're in my class. Or just talk to me if you're in my class. I'll do my best to explain or correct mistakes that I've made and the like. Um, I'll see you back for the next lecture very soon. Bye-bye.